The kingdom of hell is divided, so is earth, and so is mankind. Many of you and I are more alike than you think. I've told you all many times in the past how mankind is afraid of the unknown and afraid of what might expand their beliefs. This fear usually involves into anger, which then transforms into hatred. No Luciferian could ever live in fear of being opposed by the pagan or any other member of any other spiritual practice or religion in this ungodly world. Through revelation and extensive research, more Luciferians will begin to come together and further demonstrate the ignorance and truthfully, the silly mindedness that far too many of mankind possess who currently are members of other spiritual practices. Now, some of you practice the spiritual arts of voodoo and hoodoo, and these two spiritual practices have very sensitive and intimate connections with the kingdom of hell. So does folk magic. However, a voodoo and hoodoo practitioner and luciferian still disagree as they reject the prince of the power of the air, whose name is Satan. I've come to understand that one of the most foolish groups of human beings in the world are those who currently bend the knee to any Greek and Roman god of their choosing. My legitimate reason for saying this, and having no intention of being kind and understanding, is that I intentionally approach the world with hostility and meanness when representing who I serve. You are aware that a servant is a reflection of who they serve. Why on earth would I not harshly rebuke and even scold a heathen as well as some lost, unaware Greek god worshipping pagan who tacitly is serving who I serve, yet is foolishly unaware? They do not deserve to be approached with kindness. They are to be struck out of their slumber with harshness. I do not do what I do to simply expand Satan's kingdom one soul at a time. I also do what I do to tear down the false sense of strong faith and spiritual connections many others have built with their choice of gods and goddesses. You can say it is a form of verbal persecution rather than a physical and violent one. It isn't that I'm past committing persecution in the name of Satan. Of course not. But it is better for all to, at least at first, be given time and space to make a sound choice before anyone on the side of the oppressor chooses to strike down on the undecided with a heavy hand. Not to mention, committing persecution as of now would prove to be both foolish and pointless. Me committing persecution in the name of Satan after all morality left in this world has deteriorated and the restrainer has lifted his hand off of this sick world would simply be a physical demonstration of who I truly am on the inside. I would also receive very little pushback as well as many people in this world whether they know it or not come into agreement with me spiritually rather than the opponent and his true servants. Not those powerless faithless ones who constantly beg others for prayer and prophecy. Now, with all of that out of the way, I will now present to you all incontrovertible evidence that the false god Zeus, who is unworthy of worship, is undoubtedly Satan, who no longer is hiding behind the mask of the many false gods he's created through the centuries. Let's begin. Zeus is one of the most prominent figures in Greek mythology, often referred to as the king of the gods. He is the son of Kronos and Rhea, and he is known for overthrowing his father and assuming control of the cosmos. Zeus's story begins with his father, Kronos, who feared a prophecy that one of his children would overthrow him. To prevent this, Kronos swallowed each of his children as they were born. However, Rhea, Zeus's mother, managed to save him by giving Kronos a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes to swallow instead. Zeus was raised in secrecy on the island of Crete, where he grew strong and eventually confronted Kronos with the help of his siblings, whom Kronos regurgitated after Zeus forced him to do so. Zeus led a rebellion against his father and the Titans, resulting in their defeat and the establishment of Zeus as the ruler of the cosmos. Zeus's role in Greek mythology is multifaceted. As the king of the gods, he wields immense power and authority over both the mortal and immortal realms. He is often depicted as the god of the sky, thunder, lightning, and justice. Zeus is also known for his numerous affairs and offspring with both goddesses and mortal women, which often led to conflicts in legendary tales. 
the Greek god Zeus was also allegedly bisexual. This claim can be found true in the story of Zeus and Ganymede. Ganymede was a prince of Troy, who was renowned for being exceptionally handsome. He was said to be the most beautiful human being on the planet during his time, among both males and females. When the young prince was seen tending to sheep, Zeus caught sight of him. It is written that Zeus shape-shifted into an eagle and flew down to abduct the young boy and carry him back to Olympus where he made him a cupbearer to the gods. Their story isn't explicitly indicated as being a romantic one, but it is generally accepted as such. The reason for this being accepted is that the Greek god Zeus gave the prince his father immortal horses in exchange for the son as if Zeus was paying a dowry for a wife. It is said that Zeus's wife Hera was extremely jealous of her husband's favor for the prince and because of this, Zeus turned the young prince into a constellation in the sky to keep him safe. Another interesting connection is how Zeus, like Satan, is seen as wanting to be like the god of the Bible, the enemy of Satan, by executing the same judgment over mankind just like how God did in the Old Testament, concerning all of mankind drowning in a great flood save Noah, his family, and the animals. It is said that Zeus had become so vexed with mankind because of their corruption that he decided to flood the entire earth and drown mankind as punishment. The only people he spared were King Deucalion, son of Prometheus, and was considered the most honest man on earth, and his wife Pura. It is written that they survived the flood and went on to repopulate the earth. There is nothing the Greek god Zeus can do that Satan can. Specifically speaking, Zeus is merely a lesser, carefully constructed god created by Satan who used this lesser form of his to bring about to himself more praise and worship from mankind. Zeus is depicted as one of the most powerful gods in Greek mythology with a wide range of abilities and powers that reflect his status as the king of the gods. Some of his most notable powers include control over the sky and weather. Zeus is the god of the sky, thunder, lightning, and storms. He is said to wield the power to control the weather, summon thunderstorms, and hurl lightning bolts at his enemies. Supreme authority, as the ruler of the gods and the cosmos, Zeus is said to hold ultimate authority over both divine and mortal affairs. His decisions are final, and he is often invoked to settle disputes among the gods. Immortality, like other gods in Greek mythology, Zeus is immortal and does not age or die. He is immune to disease and injury and is unaffected by the passage of time. Shape-shifting, Zeus can change his form at will, allowing him to appear in various guises or transform into animals or objects. Divine strength, Zeus is incredibly strong, surpassing both gods and mortals in physical power. He can easily overpower his enemies and lift enormous weights. Wisdom and foresight, Zeus is often portrayed as a wise and cunning deity who possesses great intelligence and foresight. He can foresee future events and strategize accordingly. Control over fate. Although the fates ultimately determine destiny in Greek mythology, Zeus has significant influence throughout events and can intervene to alter fate or destiny as he sees fit. Within Greek mythology, Zeus's powers are vast and far-reaching reflecting his status as the most powerful deity in the Greek pantheon. It is within Greek mythology that Zeus embodies the forces of nature, governance, and divine authority, wielding his powers to maintain order and uphold justice in the cosmos. Indeed, Satan is the ruler of this entire world. Although this isn't a truth in the hearts and minds of many on earth, it matters not. Many will begin to see just how deep the rabbit hole of evil goes that leads to the footstool of Satan and will acknowledge his existence and his power. Satan being deemed the ruler of this world should be taken literally, although during the New Testament times this wasn't the case. You see in today's world just about everything is interconnected, communication, commerce, travel, technology, and all other forms of present interconnectedness. We know the world to be of all that makes up the seven continents of the earth, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica, not to mention the many oceans and seas that are used for trade routes and travel.
But back in the New Testament, the term world didn't carry such a vast meaning along with it. The term world back in those times simply meant the Roman world. You see, Israel was a vassal state and subservient to the Roman kingdom. Rome, especially during its height, was seen as the world although it only stretched from Western Europe to Northern Africa and parts of the Middle East. Attributed to just about all other ancient religions, Roman religion had a pantheon. It has been established that there are 12 gods in the pantheon and that Jupiter was the most powerful. Jupiter is the god of sky and thunder, and he is identified by his lightning bolt. According to the online etymology dictionary, Jupiter means God Father. It is a combination of the Latin duos God plus Peter, which means Father. Now check this out. This can be compared with the Greek Zeus Pater, vocative of Zeus Pater, meaning Father Zeus. Hence, Jupiter is the same deity as Zeus. So, if Zeus and Jupiter are the same, yet both of these gods point back to the existence of Satan, then this means that both Zeus and Jupiter were simply false gods created by the demonic to deceptively receive worship from mankind. Therefore, both the Greek and Roman religions are thereby false and powerless and lead their believers down a fruitless path that leads to nowhere but hell. How people serve these false gods and participate in these false religious beliefs, refusing to do further research and taking everything they see and hear carte blanche is silly in my eyes. As you all know in Greek mythology, Zeus was also the king of gods within the pantheon. World-renowned Greek philosopher Plato himself referenced this in the dialogue Critias, before it suddenly ends with the remainder of the passage now lost, having been lost through the centuries. Here is a quote from the final sentence of the dialogue Critias. Quote, Zeus, the god of gods, who rules according to law and is able to see into such things, perceiving that an honorable race was in woeful plight and wanting to inflict punishment on them that they might be chastened and improved, collected all the gods into their most holy habitation, which, being placed in the center of the world, beholds all created things. And when he had called them together, he spake as follows." End quote. You see, the Greeks and Romans used to put statues of what they call, quote, the God of Gods, in all the main temples of all other territories they conquered. This was done as a sign of their superiority and to the humiliation of the people who had been conquered. In the second book of Maccabees, chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, one such instance happened. And it reads, Not long after this, the king sent an Athenian senator to compel the Jews to forsake the laws of their fathers and cease to live by the laws of God, and also to pollute the temple in Jerusalem and call it the temple of Olympium Zeus, and to call the one in Gerizim the temple of Zeus the friend of strangers, as did the people who dwelt in that place. Now, turn your attention to the city called Pergamum which is now located in far western Asia Minor today, which would be the country of Turkey. Pergamum, also sometimes spelled with an O instead of a U, was an ancient Greek city located in what is now modern-day Turkey, near the present-day town of Bergama. It was situated in the northwest of Asia Minor, modern-day Antolia, not far from the Aegean Sea coast. During ancient times, Pergamum was one of the major cultural and political centers of the Hellenistic world. It was the capital of the Kingdom of Pergamum, which was ruled by the Attilid dynasty. The city flourished particularly during the Hellenistic period and later became an important Roman province. The altar of Zeus in Pergamum was indeed a significant religious and cultural monument. It was constructed during the reign of Eumenes II and his successor Attilus II. The altar was an enormous structure, measuring approximately 36 meters wide and 34 meters deep, and was adorned with intricate friezes depicting scenes from Greek mythology, particularly the Gigantomachy, the mythical battle between the Olympian gods and the giants. The altar of Zeus was renowned for its grandeur and artistic excellence, and it served as a focal point for religious ceremonies and sacrifices dedicated to Zeus and other gods. In the late 19th century, the German engineer Karl Heumann led excavations in the Pergamon and unearthed the remains of the altar of Zeus. Many of the friezes and sculptures from the altar were removed and taken to Germany. 
Today a reconstruction of the altar can be seen in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin where it remains one of the museum's most iconic exhibits. The relocation of the altar of Zeus to Germany has been a subject of controversy and debate, with some arguing for the return of the artifacts to Turkey. However, the altar's presence in the Pergamum Museum continues to attract visitors worldwide, serving as a reminder of the city's rich cultural heritage and significance in the ancient world. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ speaks to Christians in this very city, Revelation chapter 2 verse 13 it reads, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Notice how the Son of Man refuses to acknowledge the false god Zeus by name because he is fully aware of the real entity who was masquerading himself as Zeus. He acknowledged Satan by name, and he acknowledged the specific place where Satan had his throne on earth at that point in time. This means that the great altar of Zeus is merely a throne of Satan's. Mankind has erected many satanic thrones and is unaware of it because they're ignorant and foolish. Those of my kind aren't foolish. Those of my kind aren't in any need of any foolish experience. I do not speak in terms of race, gender, a sexual orientation, nationality, or political affiliation. You can keep that trash to yourself. I'm speaking in terms of awareness and a heightened intelligence for what is esoteric, what is wicked, and what is spiritual. The further line of evidence can also be found in a book many of you reject. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 2 it reads, You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Many scholars undeniably agree that the Apostle Paul, who was the first apostle to the Gentiles, was referring to Satan. They're wise to agree upon this, as the only evil personal supernatural entity mentioned in Ephesians is Satan. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 it says, and neither give place to the devil. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 it reads, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The Apostle Paul mentions the devil clearly when you read the titles, Evil One and the Devil. It is referring to Satan. Satan is also referred to as being the ruler of the world numerous times in the book of the opponent. This is also further solidified when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls and understand the parallels between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the book of Ephesians. One parallel would be where it reads in the Dead Sea Scrolls, quote, The first attack by the sons of light will be launched against the lot of the sons of darkness against the army of Belial. Although the demon king Belial is an entity in his own right, his very name has also been associated with being another one of Satan's many names. The Apostle Paul had asked the Christians who attended the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 through 15, quote, What fellowship has the light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? So it is clear that in these texts, which do not acknowledge nor were the authors of these texts well versed in Luciferian doctrine, that Satan and Belial are the same entity. Only true Luciferians differentiate the demon King Belial and Satan as these two beings are truly separate. Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of hell, and the demon King Belial is high in hell's ranks. Since I am correct and have accurately identified the connection between Zeus and Satan, then Satan can also be identified as being the false god Jupiter, the high god of Rome. There was a rumor among both Jewish and Christian circles during this time that the title Prince of Rome was Satan. However, he was given yet a different name. This new name was Semiel. They bestowed upon him the moniker Semiel. Described as the Prince of the Demons in the Jewish Encyclopedia, a parallel can be drawn with Matthew chapter 9 verse 34 where he is referred to as the Prince of Demons, later identified as Beelzebub or Beelzebub in chapter 12 verse 24. The name Semiel translates to venom of God, with some texts also referring to him as the chief of the Satans, where the Satan, or the Satan, denotes a role as a heavenly accuser as previously discussed. 
This perspective is evident in works like the martyrdom of Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2, attributing Manasseh's departure from the servants of the Lord to his allegiance to Satan and his angels and his powers. Later passages in the same text replace Satan with Samael and his host, indicating that envy among angels was incited by the words of this figure. Moreover, it is recounted that Samael, Satan, orchestrated the gruesome demise of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, through the hands of Manasseh due to divine visions and prophecies. Now let's talk about Demon King Bel. Demon King Bel integrated himself with the Canaanite kingdom after his fall. As I've told you all before, Luciferian doctrine isn't easily found in today's time, nor is it found in history due it to being more of a closed society. So, because of this, Demon King Bill was never in history treated as being a separate entity in his own right. He was always conflated with Satan. So as you all begin to hear me speak of Demon Bell, remember that I have to speak about him in terms of him originating from the Canaanite. In this spirit's connection to Satan, many supernatural beings are awaiting his return once the war is over. He was high in his kingdom, yet was tempted by Satan after being offered a higher position within his kingdom. The parallel between Baal and Zeus reveals a fascinating cultural and religious exchange between ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman civilizations. This exchange, often facilitated through processes like interpretatio gracia, highlights the fluidity and adaptability of religious concepts and figures across different cultures. Baal, as depicted in the Ugaritic text, emerges as a dominant deity associated with power over nature, particularly storms in the sky. His narrative mirrors that of Zeus in Greek mythology, who also reigns as the supreme sky god and wields thunderbolts as his weapon of choice. The motive of a divine battle against a primordial foe, symbolized by Baal's conquest of the sea god Yom and Zeus's struggle against Typhon, underscores their shared characteristics as divine warriors and rulers. Moreover, linguistic and archaeological evidence further strengthens the connection between Baal and Zeus. The etymological similarity between their names and ethics such as Baal Shemim, meaning Lord of Heaven, and Zeus Hypsistos, meaning Highest Zeus, suggest a shared conceptual framework underlying their roles as celestial sovereigns. The syncretism of Baal and Zeus is not merely linguistic or conceptual but also extends to religious practices and iconography. Temples dedicated to Baal Shemim, identified with Zeus in Greek inscriptions, reflected a convergence of worship between these deities. Additionally, shared attributes like the association with the bull, a common symbol of divine power in ancient Near Eastern and Mediterranean cultures, further blur the distinction between Baal and Zeus. This convergence culminates in the figure of Beelzebub whose name combines elements of Baal, meaning Lord, with symbolic significance of the house or Lord of Flies. The epithet Zeus Averter of Flies in Greek mythology provides a striking parallel, hinting at the underlying connection between Baal, Zeus, and their respective roles as divine protectors against pestilence and evil forces. This revelation provides a plausible explanation for the apparent absence of Satan in the Old Testament, while Baal's widespread presence is notable. It suggests that Satan and Baal are one and the same. Baal transcends mere idolatry. He is portrayed as a celestial being who occupies heavenly realms and mirrors Christ's attributes, albeit in a perverse manner so people say. The convergence of Baal, Zeus, and Jupiter underscores this interpretation, pointing to Satan as the underlying entity behind these mythological figures. Just as the philosopher Plato suggests, Satan, represented by Baal, seeks to exert dominion over nations and humanity. This aligns with the notion of Satan as the prince of Rome during antiquity and his continued influence over the world. In essence, Identifying Satan with Baal illuminates the theological landscape of the Old Testament and sheds light on the cosmic struggle between good and evil. It emphasizes Satan's role as the ultimate adversary, striving to usurp the divine authority attributed to Christ.